This is Powderhorn Lake, a small body of water in the center of Minneapolis, Minnesota. This is the rain that runs into Powderhorn Lake, over concrete, down drains, through pipes, until finally reaching the lake. The rain is good. It replenishes and renews Powderhorn Lake. It is part of a natural cycle, connecting clouds to lakes, to rivers, to oceans. Water is the lifeblood of the natural environment, nourishing plants, animals, people, and places. Rivers of water run through us, connect us, and keep us alive. But our concrete and pavement and roofs and lawns add something new and unnatural to the system, including pollutants and excess detritus. Detritus is organic material, such as leaves and grass clippings. It should stay in our yards and parks, breaking down to produce richer soils and healthier plants. Unfortunately, much of the excess detritus ends up on our driveways, sidewalks, roofs, and roads. Each new rain sweeps these materials into storm drains, introducing unnaturally high nutrient loads into our lakes and streams. Detritus and fertilizer cause algae to thrive well beyond natural levels, choking out other life, not to mention making our lakes much less pleasant places to swim and fish. It's not just happening in our local lakes. Streams and rivers take our excess organic materials and fertilizers down to the Mississippi River and eventually into the Gulf of Mexico where they feed massive algae blooms. The algae then die, sink, and decompose, using up most of the oxygen in the process, a condition biologists refer to as hypoxia. Without oxygen, fish and other ocean organisms die, a dead zone that can grow to over 8,000 square miles. The dead zone fluctuates in size, coinciding with the agricultural season in the Mississippi River watershed. That watershed begins in Minnesota, and the state is one of the most important contributors in both urban and agricultural runoff. In other words, what happens in our lawns and little bodies of water like Powderhorn Lake is directly connected to what happens in the Gulf of Mexico's dead zone and dead zones like it around the world. What makes Powderhorn the protagonist in this story is not its diverse patchwork of mixed density residential zoning, shops, restaurants, and cafes bounded by busy commercial corridors. It's not even Powderhorn's cultural diversity, social life, tradition, artistry, and creative spirit that makes this story worth telling. Instead, this story is about the bold steps residents are taking to clean up the lake that lies at the heart of their neighborhood and community. The residents of Powderhorn Park neighborhood are starting by installing rain gardens in their own yards, digging out sections of front and back lawns in order to plant at least 150 new rain gardens, rain gardens that will capture stormwater, allowing it to percolate into the soil where some of it will be taken up by the roots of native plants. Some will filter down into the local aquifer, and if all goes as planned, much less stormwater will end up running off of the residents' lawns and down driveways, sidewalks, streets, drains, and pipes that discharge their load into Powderhorn Lake. It's part of a bold experiment in citizen-based watershed protection. It's led by Metro Blooms, a local coalition of gardeners, scientists, landscape architects, students, community leaders, and residents seeking to make their homes and community more sustainable. A rain garden is simply a depressional area in usually a yard um, that has plants and soils that are designed to have water soak into that area and the roots of the plants help the water soak into the ground. So the roots are really critical to this whole process because the roots of a, of a rain garden plant grow deeper than the roots of our typical lawn landscaping. And um, by those roots going deeper into the ground, it's breaking up soil, which a lot of times in our urban areas is heavily compacted and actually almost acts as a hard surface itself. And those roots break up the soil. They, they create little channels where the water can soak down into the ground. And then um, they actually act kind of like a little straw and help the water suck, you know, 
soak in that way. Um, the plants also are taking up the, some of the pollutants that are in that stormwater runoff. And so they're taking that up into their plant tissues and keeping it out of the environment. Um, and then a whole other benefit of rain gardens is the whole aesthetic and habitat value. They're a great habitat for birds and butterflies and small rodents and dragonflies, which eat mosquitoes. Um, so they have a lot of benefits that way. And then, of course, just from an aesthetic standpoint, they're a great way to beautify our yards and clean our water at the same time. Rain gardens keep excess storm water from entering the storm sewers and in doing so they prevent all manner of pollution from entering uh, our watersheds that is pet feces it can be uh, of course fertilizer and uh, herbicides that people use on their lawns uh, oil from cars antifreeze of course grass clippings the Metro Blooms team is attempting to install 150 rain gardens in one community using an adjoining neighborhood as a control to assess what effects the new rain gardens will have on the quantity and quality of stormwater runoff into Powderhorn Lake. This is not just a story about clean water and beautiful flowers. It's about people who care enough about their community to take on an incredible challenge. I'm Becky Rice and I'm the executive director of Metro Blooms. My name is Corey Zoll. I am the education coordinator for Metro Blooms. Hello, my name is Rusty Schmidt. I am a landscape ecologist with the Washington Conservation District. In addition to Becky, Corey, and Rusty, the team included hardworking landscape design specialists like Michael Keene. Michael started as a graduate student volunteer and eventually became the lead landscape designer for the entire project. Michael was the guy there, not just overseeing the installation, which is what his written descri job description was, but he was there with shovel in hand, and he was, you know, being the hard worker role model um, to keep everybody on task and, and you know, working in the heat. So uh, he's, he is our superhero. But these are not your typical superheroes or environmental activists. They're people like Joyce Vincent, passionate gardeners who have transformed their love for landscape into a community-wide movement. Joyce is a member of the Metro Bloom's Board of Directors. She spent her life crafting unique gardens. The garden, of course, is awesome, if I do say so myself. Joyce invites all passers-by to come into her yard and enjoy her rain gardens, which have become a focal point for the neighborhood. The Metro Bloom's team believes that if you can bring a neighborhood to a rain garden, you can also bring rain gardens to an entire neighborhood. No one illustrates that better than Metro Bloom's board member, Bob Wolk. He's the kind of guy who builds an eco wall, uses discarded fruit cartons from grocery stores to make raised beds, and sweeps up sand from the street gutters, bags it, and reuses it on his driveway the following winter. Bob even managed to convince his entire block to install rain gardens. In the front, the rain garden project started when my wife and I were celebrating our 50th anniversary, wedding anniversary, and we were looking for something that we could do that would have more of a lasting effect. And then Metro Bloom suggested, why don't you donate a rain garden to the city on a public land? Well, we thought that was a good idea, the concept of a rain garden, but we said, oh, who's going to take care of it? Not that I don't trust the city, but, you know, it's better that if it were perhaps on private property. And so we came up with the idea, or actually my wife came up with the idea that let's offer each of our 11 neighbors a rain garden. We served a lot of wine, got them really, really sympathetic to any idea that I would propose. And we said, hey, how would you like to have a rain garden? And they said, wow, that's a great idea. At least most of them did. A couple of them were a little hesitant, but after we met with them, all 11 of them got on board. And we just had a great big party. We had about 150 of our nearest and dearest friends, and we put in 11 rain gardens in two and a half hours. It really bonded us together. There's a common thing. It's a safer community. It's a more integrated community. And I think only because of the gardens, because people just don't walk by the house. They stop and they talk to us. It's also great for the ego. Don't forget that. That sounds fun. <laughs> I'll tell you a little story about uh, Mr. Johnson. 
He was the toughest one to convince about putting in a rain garden. Because when he came to the meeting at my house, he said, Bob, I love grass. I said, okay, John, don't go for it then. Keep all your grass. He said, but what will it look like if I'm sitting in my front window and everybody else is getting a garden except me? I said, okay, John. He says, give me a small one. I said, okay. So he met with the landscaper and he's got himself a small rain garden. We put the sucker in. I'm over there across the street as usual, putting in some wild ginger on my, on my boulevard. He comes over to me, says, Bob, I've only got one regret. I said, what is it, John? It's not big enough. <laughs> it's not big enough. And now Metro Blooms would try to do for a large urban neighborhood what Bob did for his block, transform it into a neighborhood of rain gardens. It would take hundreds of people working together to bring that vision to a neighborhood-sized watershed. The work would begin with a dedicated bunch of high school students, the Mississippi Green Team. We're going to be doing a stormwater audit of the test and control neighborhood. And the Minneapolis Park Board Green Team, which is a um, youth crew, high school students, are going to be walking the two neighborhoods and they're going to be looking at people's yards to see what is the current state of the property um, in terms of do they have a rain garden, are they using native plants, do they have a rain barrel, um, are there downspouts directed to their driveway. How much of their property was impervious and how much was pervious. Impervious meant like such as cement, like the house to be considered impervious. The ground here would be considered pervious, so we had to take all that into consideration. The water coming into this lake is coming from these storm drains, like the one I'm standing on, or there's one over there on the other side. So each pound of phosphorus that gets to this lake makes 500 pounds of that stuff. That's the algae. You ever go fishing in this? Oh, no. No. have fun too? Yep. Yeah. Okay, that's important. We're going to let all the homeowners know what we're doing and that this is part of a grant project. Um, and then whoever is interested can come to a rain garden workshop to learn more about the project. Uh, once again, I'd like to thank everybody for coming. This is uh, great to see such a good turnout. So I'm going to start just kind of talking about water and how it moves through our environment and uh, the impacts of that and what we need to think about. Historically, when it rained, water hit the ground and infiltrated into the soil and uh, would reach our lakes and rivers through ground aquifers. Now, as we've come and settled the land and built things like roads and parking lots and roofs on our buildings, we take away the amount of area where that water can infiltrate into the ground. So this water has to go somewhere. The way we build, we come in and we rip off all the native vegetation and we compact the soil with big trucks and machinery. So wherever there isn't a building or a road or something, the soil is all hard and compacted, so that can't even infiltrate as much water as it normally could. But this was nature's way of cleaning its own water. As we've come in and settled, we've removed that, the possibility for the water to be cleaned. A property this size in a one-inch rain event, about 5,000 gallons of water is just going to wash right off this property. It's a tremendous amount of water. The problem is, it picks up things along the way. 
Now think about all the vehicles that drive on this road every day. You know, they're all dripping some oil or antifreeze or gasoline or who knows what else. They put salt on it every winter, they put sands on it. There's things, there's grass clippings, there's pet waste, the list goes on and on. They're not very nice things out in the street. And every time it rains, that water flushes out there and picks it all up. And it goes straight into a pipe and straight into the Powderhorn Lake. Now when you think about it that way, there's really no question why it's so gross in that lake, you know? I mean, it makes perfect sense. In these rain garden parties, this is what I dreamed of. However, while things were going well above ground, and the project appeared to be on schedule for rain garden installation to begin in 2010, problems below ground were raising serious questions about the monitoring plan. Those questions would need to be solved before the project could move forward. Right now what we're finding is that within the sewer system, we have some flat areas and some sinks within the sewer which could compromise the uh, basically the test data that we get. So we're trying to make sure there's enough velocity within the sewer systems to keep debris washed out so that that doesn't affect our, our data. We're going to get to the question of, of whether we're going to have enough data to do a, a valid comparison. There was a little bit of a learning curve. Um, at one point, um, it turned out that these, these data loggers had to be sent back for the repaired or replaced. There was a lot of sand and debris and that was just burying those probes. So next year we're going to need to offset them up the side of the pipe. But it certainly sounds worth waiting till May is over to start construction if you can. To get in 150 rain gardens we need 30 days of excavation. It does seem like we need more events and the longer we delay I think the better we're going to be. However we got to stop at a certain point and, and just start building and I think you know, we've got to give ourselves time. There's always unexpected delays. I think August 1st ballpark, just thinking about it right now, shirt cuff, I think August 1st is a good, good starting point right now. The Neighborhood of Rain Garden's project team partially solved the instrumentation problem during the fall and winter. At one point in the project, the team feared they would not get sufficiently high volume rain events to produce pre-test data. Ironically, they eventually faced the opposite problem. Major rain events were burying and washing out carefully placed instruments. Fortunately, despite that limitation, pre-test measures were sound, and they were eventually set to begin measuring the effect of new rain gardens on both the volume of water flow into Powderhorn Lake, as well as phosphorus levels. Only three questions remained. Could Metro Bloom staff and volunteers find 150 residents willing to install rain gardens? The first rain garden parties and workshops led to optimism, but recruiting became increasingly difficult after the first set of eager residents signed up. Volunteers literally went door to door asking more residents to take part. Assuming they could convince enough residents to give over portions of their lawns to rain gardens, could Metro Blooms install that many rain gardens in a single, truncated season? It truly would have to become a community effort for that to happen. Finally, if Metro Blooms could successfully recruit 150 residents and install that many rain gardens, would it matter? Would rain gardens placed over a broad swath of a sub-watershed significantly reduce the amount of water running into Powderhorn Lake after each rainstorm while improving water quality? We rejoined the Metro Blooms team again in April at the Powderhorn Park Community Center 
The landscape design team is helping Powderhorn residents and other property owners take the final steps in preparing for rain garden installation. How big a difference can we make in the, the quality of the water in the lake? And then, if we're successful, then that would be a project that would be very likely to be expanded. So today is probably going to be the first day we'll get really good uh, test data because it's raining today. We'll be able to excavate maybe five to seven rain gardens each day, which we're planning on doing through August and September. What we'll do about uh, a week ahead of time is come out, mark out the rain garden in the yard with, you know, with some paint or with some flag or in some way so that there won't be any surprises on installation day when this hole appears in your yard. So that's what we calculate for. So we take that 270 times uh, 0.104, which is, that's just the, the multiplier, right? So that's approximately 30 cubic feet of water that will be produced, the runoff in here. So uh, we just have to have a volume that can collect that, essentially. So that if we're at six inches deep, we need to have uh, 60 square feet. So you got, you'll have more than that. You'll have at least 100, 120 there. Depending on where you want to bring it then, you could, uh, you could split it right in the middle and have a high point right there. So it, this all goes that way, this goes that way, or you could high point it right there. The ones that I recommended are probably almost all in here. Here's some of the sedges. Um, this is one that I recommended for your back planting because it's a dry sedge. Most sedges are wet, um, but that one will work yeah, uh, like along your retaining wall order. So if it's limited by the sidewalk, it's a pool here. Yes, if it's, uh, if it's lower here, it'll pool here. But if it's lower over here and you give it a, give it a rope to get there, it'll pool here. And that'll be far, farther away from The first summer, we right. ripped out the late later grass, and, and I was looking at Karen was like, <laughs> this is exciting. I think uh, I'm, I'm really right. juiced. This season, in this run of excavations, we're installing 101. We've already got 16 in that we put in in June. Uh, so that would put us at 117. And then we will take a uh, close look at the remaining properties we have and see what um, possible locations we could spend the remainder of the budget and really capture a lot of water at the same time. So in the end, I think it'll probably be about 130 would be my guess. This one, I believe the homeowner first became involved uh, because the neighbor, Carol, down the street, she's been very active with getting people engaged in the project, which has been great. And uh, so then uh, Sharon, the homeowner, contacted Corey. And at that point, I come out for an on-site consultation. And uh, she and I decide on a, a location and size of the garden. And uh, from there, um, I had uh, Samuel Gear, one of our designers, uh, design it. And then uh, I mark it out on the site where it's going to go. And then the crews come, and I give them a quick little rundown of what we're going to do. And then they go to it. And so right now they're excavating the soil. We'll be putting mulch on it in a little while, and then the planting crew will come in. And then we're all set. My mother, Thelma Juanita Calloway, uh, she came to the state of Minnesota 1962-63. Um, my mother came here as a student, uh, wanting to be a nurse, and my mother loved the outdoors. One of the things that um, for her was just about healing. She felt greenery, flowers brought healing to your soul, healing to your body. She loved for us to be in the yard. It was a mandate to clean the yard all the time and to cut the grass. And I can tell you from, a, from an experience with my mother, watching her through her latter years of her life, my mother always felt that it was important to just give back to the environment, to make it beautiful. This is a memory to her because she loved planting. 
she could make something that was dying come to life, which was amazing to me. I received several plants, you know, from her funeral that are just living, and I talked to them just like she did. She had a name for each one of her plants, and I'm like, when she'd come out here to these rose bushes, she'd say, now, Mom needs you to grow. Mom wants you to get the best sun today, and I want to make sure that you're okay. And sitting under this smoke tree was one of her favorite trees, sitting in a lawn chair under here with a cup of coffee, talking to the tree, feeding the squirrels, actually talking to the birds and giving them something like bread, stale bread, to keep them happy. And they would flock around her and I'm like, mother, this is you. I heard about the rain garden project through my neighbor, Carol. And she said, you know what? Because your mother spent so much time outside, let's do this in her memory. I know that my mother is very happy and that she's smiling because we're remembering her in a special way in the environment, giving back to this neighborhood what she loves so well. Conservation Corps Minnesota um, in Iowa, they just started last year. Um, they have, I believe, two crews in Iowa this year, so we branched out. Um, we employ about 150 18 to 25 year olds throughout the state of Minnesota and Iowa. It's nice to always get a mix of projects and for these guys to kind of understand the basis of what a rain garden is. And then, you know, hopefully maybe they'll want to install one in their own yard or talk to their parents and installing one. So just kind of getting that ball moving. I know the rain garden movement's kind of picking up momentum. So help, you know, educating these guys is a great tool to having them go out and share the information with other people. We're usually out in the field, like in state, state parks and state forests, doing other type of conservation work. So this is different. We're in Minneapolis and the big city, and it should be cool to see how it affects the uh, lake nearby. They're hard workers, and they, uh, like, despite, uh, you know, terrible drought and, <laughs> you know, the, the hot, hot weather we've had, they, they keep coming every morning, so... <laughs> I keep thinking that uh, one of these days they're just not going to show up, but they do. They have not slowed down for, uh, <laughs> for, for just about anything uh, this month. I come out here when I'm out in the project area and they are working away, moving from one project to the next. They get uh, um, five or six of these gardens excavated in a day, and they just, uh, on a block like this, just move right down the street uh, from one house to the next, excavating the gardens. We help them lay out the plants, learn the layout, why certain plants have to be 
certain places and we have to take into consideration shade, sunlight, water, how much rainfall comes down and appropriately place them where they need to as well as the looks of them too is, is also important. All that stuff they're learning about, um, I know several of the kids really um, are enjoying this and um, they want to have they want to have their own rain garden at their house. So by learning this process, you're like, I want to do this at home too. So they're really excited. They can install plants in you know 12 or 14 gardens in a day. My name is Amy Thorpe. I am Sua Vang, and we are with the Mississippi River Green Team. These blue ones are blue lobelias. These little guys, if you guys can see. Uh, these are orange cone flowers, and then the yellow ones are yellow cone flowers. And these grass looking things are the blue flag iris and they are actually flowers not grass these are the fox sedge these are early sunflowers you can't really put plants wherever you some plants are more they retain water better so they go further into the middle of the rain garden and some can't handle as much so they're on the edge. We've been in a lot of different places. The first week of the summer we actually worked with Metro Blooms. It's kind of the guinea pig week to see how this would really go when we got into this really super intensive three weeks of installation. That was really our kickoff and our bonding week of getting to know each other and figuring out how to utilize everybody's skills. Now we're back and I think they've got it down. Really, we're down to the last couple of days with Metro Blooms, and then I know they've got volunteers coming in to help out. And I know the kids that are gonna come back next year, I think we're gonna have to do a tour and see how much everything grew, make sure it all lived, and all the homeowners are taking good care of their gardens. <laughs> got about 70 gardens completely installed so far uh, at the end of four weeks of the project and today we're expecting about uh, at least 50 volunteers to show up and these folks are going to split up into planting crews and install plants in at least 20 gardens uh, this morning. Uh, we've got some bagels and iced coffee and uh, uh, we're going to have a real real life church basement potluck uh, at noon today. Uh, to wrap everything up and we'll do some walking tours of the gardens that we've installed over the last several weeks. We'll break everybody up into planting teams and we'll go out in groups. We're going to plant at least 20 rain gardens this morning. If you are one of the master gardeners who has joined us this morning, uh, check in with Michael who's sorting out plants under that tree over there. They're all over the place. So we'll get a map and we'll walk. Well, um, so they're either going to be on Chicago, Elliott, or Tank. So just okay. these three streets in between 31st and 32nd. Oh, okay, fine. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Right. All right. So for the most part, uh, a master gardener is going to be traveling with every group who will have a plan for the garden. And this is a plug, which is a lot of what we're going to be planting today. Very small little plant. And also, as you can see, it's pretty root bound, which means that it's been growing in its little container all summer. And so the roots have just been sort of going around and around and around and are kind of in a little knot. 
And so if you plant this plant just like this, a lot of times the roots don't know how to get out and get out and expand into the soil so that the, the plant can grow and, and begin to uh, expand. Take your fingers and just kind of break up the roots that'll really be able to, when you plant it, start to grow out in a lot of different directions. Because once these plants are planted, they really need a good amount of uh, water regularly right at this time, especially at this time of year when it's so hot because these gardens have a tendency to dry out and they need a lot of maintenance right at the very beginning. But once you get through the first, uh, you know, a couple months of the sort of hot season that we're in right now, then the plants will be able to sort of cool and mature and they should be almost full size by the end of next year. Well, today is the last day of our planting. Uh, we've, throughout the month of August, which has been the hottest month of the summer, and the Mississippi River Green team has been planting the gardens. They planted the first 70 gardens. So their time is up. They're getting ready to go, to go back to school. And we had 20 gardens left that we had to plant. So we you know, asked people to volunteer. We have the homeowners ask them to come out and we ask our master gardener friends, the Hennepin County master gardeners, and anybody um, that we knew that had been to our rain garden workshops, um, if they would come out and help us plant the rest of these gardens. So the response was just overwhelming. It has an impact on the water quality, first of all. But I think beyond that, it also has a real positive impact just in terms of beautifying the neighborhood. And, and I think that has an impact on a lot of things, you know, just in terms of how people think about the neighborhood. And, and uh, I think also, yeah, people drive through here and they, they um, maybe not familiar with the neighborhood or have certain perceptions of what powder horns like. I think they might think differently once they see just, you know, how beautiful it is. Because of the way the sidewalks slope, there's a lot of runoff there, so I'm hoping that that'll catch a lot of the storm water. This has been a wonderful project to kind of get people out and meet their neighbors and get excited about gardening, and so I'm, I, I think it's, it's a nice neighborhood and it's getting nicer. The gardens will help a lot. It's just fun to see people walking around and, oh, there's a rain garden, and so it's, uh, accomplishing many purposes, I guess. I mean, we certainly hope that it helps clean up Powderhorn Lake, but it's definitely beautifying the neighborhood and uniting the residents. And so it's uh, a great project. I'd heard a lot about rain gardens just generally in, the, in, in recent years, and I, um, it all kind of came together because I'd like to do something like that in my own garden, and I'm, I'm not much of a gardener, and I thought, well, this would be a great way to get my kids involved in some volunteering this summer, to teach them a little bit about it so they could do it themselves and to learn myself. When the water goes down into the ground instead of across into the storm drain, the water is still going into the lake. It's just taking a couple of weeks to get there instead of a couple of minutes. And it's getting Yes, exactly. And it's not carrying litter with it. Well, as people come back, we're basically going to give everyone a chance to, you know, drink some water, relax, and sort of stretch for a second. And then, uh, basically, this is going to be the big sort of culminating planting event. This is the grain garden for the Mount Olive Church. And so this is in the context of their large parking lot where there's, the water sort of flows across the parking lot this way. And we're going to be directing the water from the parking lot into this low basin here. 
and then planting it all is a big uh, sort of native planting that'll sort of hopefully spruce up the street and provide some interest while at the same time offsetting the runoff created by the parking lot. You're able to sort of take a relatively large area of impervious surface and direct it all into one spot where you can then infiltrate it into the ground. In residential rain gardens, to capture the runoff from impervious surfaces, it means having lots of smaller gardens as opposed to this one where you can make sort of a larger one. So anybody who would like to leave right now to tour some rain gardens, come with me. Otherwise, in 10, 15 minutes, we'll have another one leaving. All right. Well, I think we will walk down Chicago first, and we'll see some that we installed in June. So we get a good idea of what they look like a few months after. And then we will loop around and see some ones that we've been installing this month. So this apartment complex here has only one downspout. So the entire roof comes out this pipe right here. So that's why we have a pretty large garden. And this garden is also collecting water from that downspout off the garage. So a lot of water comes into this garden. And so that's why you, you see this is probably what, 250 square feet. So it's a pretty good sized garden here, but um, already starting to fill out. You know, a lot of these plants, like these Joe Pye weed here, these were tiny little things just two months ago. And you can see our, how fast they're growing. This is spring planting? This is June. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so this, you can see this is pretty uh, magnificent to see this m amount of growth, so. And part of the reason is because these, uh, these gardens get a lot more moisture uh, because of the way they're designed. A funny side note, uh, the, the owner, they have cats and they tie them up to that post right over there. And the, the first time they let the cats out after the garden was planted, they just went straight for the cat mint there and were rolling all <laughs> over in it. And so they love it. And um, it was a, a week after these gardens were built, we had a really big rainstorm here. And uh, the next morning they were full of water and it all drained out that day. So they work. Yeah. We can keep going over here to the next house. There's another big one in the backyard there. Uh, we've got all sorts of uh, coneflower, lobelia, early sunflower, blazing stars, Joe Pye weed, motorcycles, um, and blue flag iris. All right, we'll keep moving on. We've got some more down here. So they went ahead and built in all these walls and this new brick pathway here. And they actually built this garden themselves. And then we built this one for them. And then we all, we planted them together. And so it's a good example of how uh, the homeowners have really bought into this project. And um, they have since put in rain barrels and are putting in a, a pervious driveway in the backyard. Oh, cool. So they've, yeah, they're awesome in my book. I will also be installing what's called a rubber razor across this driveway, which is simply just a piece of rubber that sticks up out that you can drive over and everything, but all the water that comes uh, down the driveway then is redirected. And then that also keeps these fine particles like this out of the alley, which yeah. end up in Powderhorn Lake. And attached to each one of those particles is things like phosphorus that's causing the algae blooms. So as you can see here, this homeowner has uh, installed their own dry creek bed, taking the water from the downspout into the garden. So this is really exciting to see. This is gonna be a, like a fantastic garden, I think, especially, I mean, this is so cool to see people really taking a vested interest in these gardens. Now, one thing I should mention in terms of design, when you get to a larger garden like this, rather than having sort of one of these or three of these, maybe five of these, we start to have much larger plant massing. So uh, for instance, um, all these plants in here are all the same thing. That's all Black Eyed Susan. So there's, you know, I don't know, 15 of them. Or there's prairie smoke down there, probably another 15 there. This iris here, there's probably 20 iris right there. This garden has already seen some rainstorms. You can see everything's already uh, in shape. There isn't any, any problems or anything like that. So it's doing its job. More than 100 rain gardens were installed in the test area during that unusually hot summer season. Over winter, 
Metro Balloons began to take stock of what they had accomplished. But first, a bit of celebration was in order. So yeah, we've got some EPs for sale in the back there. Eight dollars and 25% of anything we sell is going to Metro Blooms. <laughs> so yeah, and if you put that in, that's the first thing you're gonna hear. And you know what the next thing is? This. One, two, one, two, three. Will you say come back? It's an awesome turnout. I, I, I never would expect there would be so many people here. It's, just, it's so good to see so many people out here to support Metro Blooms. And uh, we're all having a great time enjoying the music. They should put it on every year. Yeah. They should come back again next year yeah. and do it again for us. Rock the Rain Garden. <laughs> rock. Rock. You can enjoy these great nuts with some soy milk. Next award goes out to Tara Klein, who helped us out with all of our workshops this year. She was our friendly face and uh, greeted everyone at the door and was very organized. And because of that, she gets the Pam Beasley Award for putting on a friendly face. After celebrating their hard work, project leaders and volunteers began to take stock of what they had accomplished. I think already I can say that the, the project was a success. We've um, uh, we were hoping with the money that we received to have 100 to 150 rain gardens put in. We have 122. Uh, we were expecting to get 50 the first year, 100-ish uh, uh, the second year, and a 50 the third year. Uh, we didn't put any in the first year, and we got 122 this summer. So we've, we've made our goal, um, and uh, we still have a little bit of money and time, so we might get to our 150 by next year yet. During that installation, phase uh, in August. There were days when we had one Mississippi River green team working uh, in our nursery site in J.D. Rivers Garden and we had a, another green team crew installing plants in the test area and we had a Minnesota Conservation Corps crew excavating gardens and it was very impressive to see that much happening all at once. Next year, the Powderhorn Gardens will look like these one-year-old rain gardens in Bob Wolf's neighborhood. And the year after that, they will start to look like this. The aesthetic transformation will be dramatic, but did all of the days, hours, and months of hard work and worry make any difference in water quality? Did transforming the Powderhorn into a neighborhood of rain gardens have a measurable impact on the quantity and quality of water running into Powderhorn Lake? Smaller projects have demonstrated radical impacts on stormwater runoff. But could an area the size of an entire city neighborhood demonstrate similar results? Or would it require additional structural and behavioral changes, like redirecting downspouts, installing rain barrels, reducing impermeable surface, sweeping gutters, and making additional changes to produce a measurable and meaningful impact? We are gaining new evidence every day, learning more about what it takes to create a neighborhood of rain gardens, and more importantly, a cleaner watershed. It took us a while to get the instruments in the right place, and then we were worrying about getting the rain events that we needed, but so for the first year of the project, that was my number one concern, was making sure we had good um, we were able to have good pre-test data. Once the rain gardens are in, there's always the opportunity to get post-installation data, but we had one year to get that good pre-test data. So that was a big concern of mine, and I think uh, we did get it. We want to be able to show at the end of the day that um, installing rain gardens in, on residential property is going to make a difference. We have had plenty of rain this year, so we've had plenty of opportunities to monitor. When we've had a one-inch rain event, you can see the graphs are pretty much the same. And so we've had good comparisons. Now, um, we've got the rain gardens in. They're still studying. They're still monitoring. We won't know everything until probably next year when we get through the data. So it's going to be a little time before we actually see how much good we, we've actually done. Preliminary evidence was promising. 
after the initial season of installation, over 56,000 square feet of impervious surface now had its water redirected to rain gardens in the test neighborhood. A 21% decrease in the amount of runoff participating households were sending directly to the stormwater system in Powderhorn Lake. A 7.8% decrease for the test area as a whole. Even more rain gardens would be going in the following year, further adding to the project's positive impact. Meanwhile, important lessons have been learned about the material as well as social challenges of transforming the basic water stewardship practices of an entire city neighborhood. You know, I'm concerned about the fact that we have not been able to um, disconnect a lot of the impervious surface in the neighborhood. So we always knew that the, the backyard is where most of the water is coming off um, the majority of these properties. Um, but, you know, the backyard is where people have their driveways, and the backyard, they're not willing to give up that impervious surface. And there's, uh, we just, a rain garden might not be the best answer to get to that disconnect. So I guess as we look forward to our test results, that's something that makes me the most nervous, is have we been able to make the significant difference that we need to show. Now we've installed all these rain gardens and I know people with all this rain gardens installed we should be able to make a big difference but we still haven't been able to disconnect a lot of those impervious surfaces and I guess that's that's what worries me is that we is what are our test results going to show. We were working in a tough neighborhood um, that we had a lot of rental properties where uh, the home, the, the landowner might not live there and yet we want to put a rain garden there and then have to take care of it. Or the other part of this is that uh, just the neighborhood we were working in had a lot of uh, backyards going to the garage, going to the alley. And so the backyards actually had the most water leaving the site. However, it was difficult to break through that opportunity of getting rain gardens in the backyards because that's where the kids play, where the activities occur. Because anytime you're working with landscape architecture or things like that, you really are working a whole spectrum of things. So you have engineering, the biology, the science end of things, but then you also have the psychology of what works in somebody's yard to keep it moving, the sociology of how to uh, talk uh, these folks to keep up with the Joneses. And we went through a, a tough economic time right now and built a hundred, you know, 20 some gardens that people are going to have to take care of. So there is a number of things that we had to think through. I don't know if we have all the answers yet, but I think we've got the right questions. There are a lot of tools that are available for us to clean our waters and to take care of the water that's running across the land and picking up pollution and getting into our lakes, rivers, creeks, and wetlands. Rain gardens are just one of those tools. Um, there are a lot of different things that we as, for example, the watershed district do. We build large holding ponds and um, wetland restorations and creek um, restorations where we're putting the bends back in the creek, those kinds of things. But those are typically done on public pieces of land or larger tracts of land. And there's only so much of that land available to us that we really have to work with. Most of the land in the area that drains to these lakes is privately owned and it's a lot of its residential land and a rain garden is one of those residential applications that people can do in their own yard and really take responsibility for the rainwater that falls on their property and that means that there's that much less water that's getting into the streets and that's getting into the storm drain that the city and the watershed district and the other government agencies that are charged with keeping our helping keep our water clean um, have to deal with because each and every one of us should be taking responsibility for the rainwater that falls on our own property. My expectation at the beginning of this project was that people would be knocking down our doors to participate and get a rain garden in their yard um, but that just that just didn't turn out to be true. It took us, you know, a good year to get those numbers. Include the community in the planning uh, of the pro project from day one. It's not just a matter of having an idea and telling it to some people and saying, you know, you should do this. Because we do all need to be committed for the long haul.
Returning to the shores of Powderhorn Lake, did it all matter in the end? That still remains to be seen. As of the completion of this film, there were too few rain events to effectively compare runoff from the test and control neighborhoods. However, we will report the results of ongoing analyses and follow-up interviews on our website, raingardenmovie.org. In truth, a project like A Neighborhood of Rain Gardens never really ends. The three years of hard work and creativity captured in this film are just the beginning. But it represents an excellent beginning, with bold ambitions matched by strong efforts and high hopes buoyed by direct action. A difference has already been made, including a range of new environmental stewardship activities in the Powderhorn neighborhood, sparked in part by Metro Bloom's Rain Garden Project. I think it's already been a success in that we have a number of folks interested. And then finally, the Neighborhood Association is already saying, wow, you really energized our neighborhood. Let's continue that. So we think we're going to try to set up this street sweeping uh, every year or a couple times a year and uh, try to continue this beyond when the grant is finished next year. What we have done in you know one small 10 block area around Powderhorn Lake is about an eighth of the land that is draining to Powderhorn Lake. So it's not a big leap to say, well, if we did this eight more times around the lake, we could make significant improvement in the quality of the water. Even before we started installation on this project, um, there were neighborhoods across the metro area that heard about what we were doing and said, we want to do this here. As we move forward with other projects, we're going to start with that. Where do we need to make the difference? Um, in the stormwater and then engage. What do we need to engage that specific target? Every time I talk with one of those neighborhood groups, I say, okay, 15's a good start, but we're gonna put in 15 as kind of a demonstration to putting in them all around the lake because 15 is only a demonstration. Someone said to me the other day, you know, in another project, there were 22 rain gardens installed. Can you even imagine that? You know, I can. <laughs> as a matter of fact, I can imagine that. Uh, as someone said, it's not a silver bullet, it's more like a silver BB. And uh, if enough BBs get together, then perhaps we can make a difference in our water quality. I think it's going to um, increase community because once you have your rain garden, you're going to think it's cool. You're going to try and persuade your neighbor. You're growing perennials. And if you're a gardener, you know you have to divide your perennials. So it's another means of sharing and passing things along. So I think that enthusiasm and commitment will grow. So it would go beyond our original target neighborhood watershed. And people will, there will be more of it. And Powderhorn Park, the, you know, this had better look better too. <laughs> In a nutshell, uh, sweating boatloads <laughs> and moving wheelbarrows of soil. <laughs> Tell us your name and what you're doing. I'm Anna. I'm planting a plant. I'm Becky Rice and I'm the executive director of Metro Blooms. And we installed 150 rain gardens this year. That's a lot. Sort of like discovering marijuana the first time where you wow, you like it and you want more and it becomes somewhat addictive. So that's what happened to the both of us. So we just move forward as if it's all... Oh, I'm so sorry. Let's go ahead and cut uh, well, I guess they call it the, the red one. Oh, yeah. Yeah. 